It's very nice to be here. Uh, I come in peace for all mankind, so uh, and womankind as well, if I may dare to represent them. Uh, the way I thought I would structure the the thing is uh, basically read a, a bit from my new book, which I hope then establishes my credentials as uh, an authentic. UFO witness and possible abductee. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I think about it, because I don't think about it what most people think about it. My dream from the time I was eight or nine was to encounter a UFO, because I always had the impression that if you would encounter one, you could understand it. That it was maddening to realize that it seemed to have a great affinity for people who live in trailer courts, but very little affinity for anybody I knew. And so you constantly had to filter these eyewitness reports by people that you wouldn't send to the corner store to buy milk. So this was a problem and it will haunt, I'm sure it haunts many of you who have never encountered a UFO. So I'll read the description of the encounter, then talk a little bit about my conclusions and ideas about it, and then we can just uh, have a discussion. I guess I should say a little bit about my method. I really am a fence sitter. I loathe science and am always keen to attack it in most situations, though not here, because I love reason, and I'm perfectly aware of the difference. I also know what, it, what uh, a concept means like rules of evidence. It's been, what, 47 years since the Rainier Lights, or close to it, and the phenomenon has not become more explicit. The hysteria has become more explicit and has wandered first in one direction and then another. But if this is a contact, it's the most peculiarly uncontact-like contact it's possible to imagine. It's always, it reminds me of people say of the crop circles, you know, they're communicating. Yes, but if they are, they picked an incredibly obscure medium in which to do it because we who love communication can glean very little from what they're trying to say. I have to introduce the context because it wasn't like that we just happened to be driving in a lonely and remote place and suddenly, uh, no, it wasn't like that. We were in the center of the Amazon basin. We had come there uh, to explore tryptamine hallucinogens. These are short-acting, very powerful psychedelic drugs. And the reason we were so interested in these drugs is because in encounters with it in the pure chemical form, it was invari the intoxication was invariably characterized by encounters with elves gnomes, fairies, thousands of these things. And this was, uh, and this is something I'm going to, um, you know, try and convince the UFO community of. What we drug people have that you don't is repeatability. <laughs> and the scientists always said to you UFO people, what you don't have is repeatability. They don't want to even talk to us. <laughs> but it is true that, that when you smoke DMT, for example, at a sufficiently high and prepared dose, you get elves.
Everybody does. Uh, you may not believe it, but on the other hand, it only takes five minutes to prove that I'm bullshitting you 100%. Surely anyone who studied UFOs and alien intelligence for as many years as the people represented here have can afford to invest 10 minutes in the wild-eyed assertion that all you need do is inhale deeply three times and you know you want contact you want elves you want alien intelligence you'll have it up the kazoo <laughs> my entry into psychedelics began very naively it was presented as instant psychotherapy or insight however vaguely defined what i discovered when you make your way through these chemical families is that not all psychedelics are alike. And this very small family of compounds called the tryptamine hallucinogens bear careful examination if we're seriously interested in this question of extraterrestrial penetration of the human world on two grounds immediately the mushroom bears looking at first argument entirely a physical argument psilocybin is for phosphoryloxy nn dimethyltryptamine what this means is, is that there is a phosphorus group substituted at the four position of the molecule. Now, here's the headline, folks. This is the only four phosphorylated indole on this planet. On this planet. Now, if you were searching for extraterrestrial thumbprints, on the biology of Earth, you would look for molecules that are unique, that cannot, don't have near relatives spread through other life forms. In psilocybin, we have a perfect example of this. It is the only four phosphorylated indole known to occur in nature. Nature doesn't work like that, folks. Nature builds always on what has previously been accomplished. So this is a red flag saying at the molecular level, this thing looks like an alien artifact at the molecular level. Now, let's cut to the chase. What happens when you take 30 milligrams of this stuff? <laughs> I don't know how sophisticated this audience is. People who have never taken hallucinogenic drugs but have some mild interest in it or just in the course of generally educating yourself about reality, I think people who have never taken psychedelics think that it's sort of like dreaming while you're awake or ge geometric patterns, colors. They always say, the colors, the colors, malarkey, the colors, forget the colors. It is not like that. Psychedelic experiences at effective doses, not piddling doses, effective doses, are visionary scenarios. They are three-dimensional unfoldments of information that is extraordinarily complex, architectonically connected, and ordered. That's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what is unique to psilocybin. What is unique to psilocybin is that overlaid over what I just described is, big surprise, a voice. A voice. Everybody knows this who has to do with this stuff. Gordon Wasson, Richard Schultes, Albert Hoffman. The giants know that this stuff is animate. This is not a drug. It's something which is disguising itself as a drug in order not to spread alarm. There is a voice which speaks to you in the language of your homeland, whether that be Mazatecan or English. And the voice surprises you. 
In other words, you cannot anticipate it. Now, of course, at this point, though I don't imagine many of them have forced their way in here, the psychological school will come forward and say, well, it's a voice, a typical of a mental aberration, symptom one of schizophrenia, a voice. Yes, yes, we are not naive. We read, we went to the same schools you did, thank you. If we are in fact being penetrated by a non-human intelligence that presumably somehow, perhaps not physically, but perhaps physically, can cross from star to star, then we are dealing with something vastly more sophisticated than ourselves. That's just given at the get-go. Well, if it's vastly more advanced than we are, then DNA sequencing, uh, complete understanding of the molecular genesis of thought, so forth and so on, would be no problem for that level of technical sophistication. You would also like to think that ethics and good taste would keep pace with this evolutionary process. So to my mind, the idea of fleets of alien spacecraft filling the skies of Earth, that's as unsubtle as kicking down somebody's front door with an M1 tank to announce, we're here. I don't think you would do it that way. If you really wanted to study a aboriginal race, and you really had a hot technology, what you would do is you would study their social psychology, and you would say, are there any chinks in the armor of their expectations about how reality behaves? And you would discover, in studying us, this species intoxicates itself. And it has a curious attitude towards its intoxications. Anything goes. So if somebody drinks a pint of Stolichnaya and announces that they see pink elephants, we are all amused. We say, of course you do. You were drunk out of your mind. Isn't it obvious that an alien would hide its presence in an intoxication? That this is the non-invasive, tasteful, respectful way to have intercourse with another species. You say, you put yourself into a plant. You put a barcode into a molecule. Then the shaman intoxicates himself and he says, aha, it's an ancestor spirit or it's the soul of the plant. But whatever it is, it's giving me good information. It's telling me where the reindeer went. It's telling me what the weather will be next week. It's telling me who stole the goose, and it's telling me who slept with who, and it's telling me who among the ill members of my tribe will live and who will die. And with that information, I can make a political career <laughs> as a healer. Plato said, time is the moving image of eternity. The way I think of shamanism and psychedelic voyaging is that it is transdimensional travel, literally, not in some, not, not in the undefined way that you often hear it used, but in the mathematical sense. A shaman and a psychedelic person and a UFO contactee is someone who has seen the end. They simply didn't know what they were looking at because who knows what the end looks like. The, the world of historical possibility concresses into a mercurial hologrammatic disk, part bios, part machine, part syntax, part mind. The categories dissolve. The world is not what it appears to be.
I was very interested in uh, I, I, I was very interested in coming to this thing and studying the psychology of the group and it was very fascinating to me that both of the speakers where I listened to the whole thing were very concerned to refute the psychological explanation, which I gather is the Antichrist around here. Uh, and as I understand it, somebody said to me, the first thing they said to me, I thought, my God, these people are on end. He said, I want you to know that this Jungian thing is bullshit. He said, okay, uh, that's fine. Um, however, this is like beating a dead horse. Has the news from quantum physics not reached the UFO community? Is it not now thoroughly assimilated that an observer is necessary for reality to exist at all? It's all psychological. There's no distinction. And so these people who have such enthusiasm for beryllium ships from Arturus or wherever should be informed, you know, same, same. That's important news. It is now, and where is it coming from? Let's, let's not rush past this here. <laughs> Physics has always been the paradigmatic science. All sciences have physics envy. Why is that? Because it's not unlikely in a physics experiment to be able to predict an experimental result to three decimal points of accuracy. That's science. You don't get that in sociology. You don't get that in psychology. You don't even get that in biology. And, and physics is the most mathematical of all the sciences. So around the towering edifice of physics, the more frightened and uncertain of the sciences had gathered near her skirts. Well, so now what is physics telling us? Saying, uh, folks, uh, hold your horses here. It turns out the cheerful world of uh, billiard ball-like atoms w s winging their way through Newtonian space is in for serious revision. It turns out that these particles aren't even particles. They're waves. Well, no, not exactly. They're both. Well, what I actually meant to say was, and you discuss Discover the babble of mad people is what is coming out of the physics departments today. Science has collapsed. Its core has given way to contradiction. Number one, it's incomprehensible. Number two, it's self-contradictory. Number three, you can't uh, conceptualize it except in some enormously complicated mathematical phase space anyway. So this concern for the materiality of the saucers is a completely anachronistic issue. Carried far enough, the analysis of this stage will show you that it has no quote reality to it. Now this plays nicely right into my hands. Let's go back now to those drug-induced hallucinations. You know, I think every, every UFO investigator in the country, uh, they have these uh, forms when they come rushing out to your house when you report an 11 mile long green cigars overhead. And the first question is, are you intoxicated? Do you have a history of taking drugs? What is your relationship to altered states? Most encounters with extraterrestrials take place in altered states. That's what altered states are. Reality is, you know, the tip of an iceberg of irrationality that we've managed to drag ourselves up onto for a few panting moments before we slip back into the sea of the unreal.